Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining us for the next in our series of Calm COVID Convos. Each webinar convo that we have is going to focus on a different, to different topic centred around the whole impact of COVID-19 to our businesses, to you, to your families, your team, your wealth, your finances, and so forth. The whole idea is to take all the stress, the hype, and the drama out of the conversation and just have a calm convo on what you need to know, and more importantly, what you can or should be doing right now to protect your position and help you be ready for when we reach the bottom of the economic blip, whenever that may be, and get ready to press the go button again. For those of you who don't know me, my name is John Knight. I'm the Managing Director and Founder of Business Depot. I'm a chartered accountant, yes, and been one for 25 odd years. Um, but these days, spending more and more of my time talking to people about bigger talking to people about bigger picture stuff within their business from mentoring and strategy or just being that shoulder to lean on or in more recent times that shoulder to cry on. So uh, basically what I do more than anything else is I just help people get unstuck from whatever it is they're doing within their business to help them achieve whatever they want to do to make it happen. Now, I should be joined on here also by Rebecca as well as attendee, but um, for some reason, she's just fallen off. Let me just see if I can get her on here again. Okay, I can see what's happened. Just give me one second, guys. Otherwise, I can't do this without my co-host. Okay. Hello, Rebecca. Hello. Sorry Hello, Rebecca. That. Small <laughs> technical little blip. Every, every one, every convo has had something little go on with it. That's all right. That's right. That's okay. So, of course, joining me um, today, as with all of our Calm COVID convos, is Rebecca Mahalik, Director of Business Depot Sydney, also heads up our national offering around tech advisory. She's a chartered accountant herself, so she's having all those conversations out there as well. Um, with their businesses. Welcome, Rebecca. Thanks, John. Um, good to have another one of these sessions together. Um, just a quick shout out to everyone who's joining with us today. We'll try to answer as many of your questions as possible during the webinar, but if you could make sure that you use the functionality in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen instead of the chat, it's much easier for us to track the questions and make sure we get as many of them ticked off as possible if you use the Q&A. Thank you, Rebecca. Of course, um, today we're also joined by, by Cara Brett from Bounce Financial. So we've asked Cara to come on board. Cara is a financial planner. Um, I'd describe her as a financial planner who truly cares about that, that personal side um, of the finances for the individuals. And so you've been fielding a stack of conversations, I dare say, in the last little while about different income support packages and so forth. So welcome, Cara. Thank you very much for having me. And yes, I've had that conversation on a daily basis multiple times. So yes, we've got a, a lot to talk about. Well, we're going to dive into that a little bit deeper. So as I just alluded to, today's combo um, is to focus on the different income support packages that are available out there, really for your employees. But why we wanted to cover this topic is because we know the employers, and especially in small to medium enterprises, they care deeply about their team and they hate the idea of having to lay them off or to reduce their wages. And so we're being asked questions over and over again around, well, if we do this, what is the support that is available to our team? And that's why we've got um, Cara on for us today. We're also going to touch on the job keeper payments, which were announced on Monday as well. Now I emphasize with those, we don't have legislation for the job keeper payments yet. So that means we've got nothing to rely on really but so what we're really doing is we're going off media advices um, website information and so forth so we'll give you our sort of take on things but of course we have to check this to whatever the final um, legislation looks like okay let's get into it so Cara you've been fielding lots of questions lots of queries from from people what's the number one thing that people are asking about okay so probably the biggest question I've been getting is does my income protection insurance cover me for this period? Um, I've probably had that four times a day, every day since this all started. And um, so some people have income protection in their superannuation funds. Some people have previously, obviously already, you know, purchased income protection that they have directly. Um, 
And a lot of people think it covers them for things like redundancy. And unfortunately, 99.9% .9 of time, income protection doesn't cover redundancy um, unless you have a very, very specific policy that has redundancy cover in it. Even if it does, um, it's likely only for three months and it, it's probably not going to give you the benefits that you think. So income protection, unless you personally get sick or injured, and it could be sick from, from coronavirus, obviously, um, will not pay your income um, in this instance for pretty much most people. And that's, I think, been a really huge misconception as part of this. And, and Cara, is that specific to employees that have income protection yeah. insurance? Is that different if you're a business owner? Oh, not necessarily. So business owners can have income protection insurance too. Um, but the same rules apply. You need to be unable to work due to illness or injury um, yourself, not other people, not what's going on in the environment. So employers or business owners can still have income protection, depends on how it's structured and the setup and it relates to how much you earn in your business. But um, it does doesn't matter whether which which way or, or you know essentially it's saying the only way you would get that payment is if you were the one who contracted coronavirus and then couldn't work past the waiting period okay. um, so for most people the waiting period is a minimum of 30 days but sometimes yeah. longer you being asked about insurance rebecca um actually no no one's asked us about insurance yet i think that they most people seem to prefer to go down the path of trying to get what they can get from their employers or going um, to Centrelink. There hasn't been a lot of people talk about insurance, um, even their income protection insurance so far. What about the business level? Because I know I've had a lot of questions around business interruption insurance. and We um, have those. Pardon? We have had quite a few um, conversations around the business interruption insurance and even ourselves um, looked into that. But this is pretty much not covered by most policies, unfortunately. Yeah, the advice I got from our broker and other brokers is that essentially pandemics are excluded from business interruption insurance. So even the businesses don't have that support. Okay, so let's say I'm an employer. I love my team. Maybe I've got a small team of about 10 people. So I fall below the redundancy requirements. Um, and I know that maybe I'm a, I'm a hospitality and I've had to close my doors and I simply cannot trade. Maybe I've got two people still there doing some takeaway um, cooking or something or other. What is available for those other eight people that I've now either laid off or stood down um, by way of, of job seeker allowances and those types of things? Um, okay, so in the first instance, because this is actually what exists right now, I'll, I'll, I'll talk, and we'll probably all talk to the job keeper one in a second, mm. uh, because that's not obviously legislated, and even if it was, it's not until May. Um, the job seeker allowance is the one that's currently available. Now, the job seeker allowance basically encompasses all of those new start allowances that you know were typically typically talked about, um, and so anybody who was, let's say, a permanent employee that's been stood down, even casual contractors, um, they're pretty much all encumbered in there. And the job seeker allowance is pretty much going to be the one that they're looking at. And on top of the job seeker allowance is that coronavirus subsidy, which essentially, when you add it together, the benefits available, it's somewhere in the realm of about 1,100 to 1,200 per yeah. fortnight. Yep. that is potentially available once it's added together. So that's sort of the first port of call and probably the most significant one available outside of the job keeper one if and when it becomes available. Yeah. So, if it, and, and are you aware whether it makes a difference whether someone is stood down or, or terminated as an employee, whether it changes their entitlement to that? My understanding is it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily matter. A lot of the requirements that would normally be um, requested from Centrelink are being waived. So things like um, showing proof um, on certain things, getting letters written and stuff. I think a lot of those are being waived because they're pretty much like, we need to get through this processing. Yeah. So I don't think it, it, it's really going to be taken into account. Norm that... Normally, yes, maybe, but in yeah. this case, yeah, because we did talk we did talk about um, sort of terminations versus stand downs in our previous um, calm COVID convo. So if you if you need to know some more about that, refer back on our blog. You'll find the recording of that webinar, because of course they've waived the waiting period for job seeker, 
Um, they're waiving temporarily the asset test as well. And they announced the other night that they're increasing the income test. Because I understand, Cara, that a lot of people were being excluded with the existing income test when they yeah. were going for job seeker. Is that right? Yeah, so the previous income test was quite low. It's, it was $48,000 a year. So once your partner was on $48,000 or more, you basically weren't able to get anything. Um, now, as we know, 48,000 isn't necessarily a lot for, for potentially a family to be living on. So they increased that to 79,000, um, which is a little bit more palatable for some people. But you can also, uh, as the individual, earn a very, very small amount before it affects you. I think it's like $100 a fortnight or something. Um, yeah. So you could potentially be working a couple of hours, as an example, and still qualify for the job seeker, assuming your partner was under that 79000 And do you know if that 79000 is effective now? Or does that, is that like a regulation adjustment? Or do you know if um, we have to wait for legislation for that? My understanding is it's effective now because yeah, I have okay. had clients who have been able to go through on that. Um, so, yes, yeah, that's my understanding. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, and are there any other government assistance or government support available to, to people that lose their job? Um, other than if, the job keeper, which we'll come back to later. Yeah, so... When applying for these things, I'm, I'm encouraging people to make sure they go through the full process because in a lot of circumstances, you can probably get things like rent assistance, there's the energy supplement um, payment. I mean, it's, they're small amounts, but to be honest, they all, they all matter. Uh, if you're on job seeker, you also qualify for the healthcare card. Yep. Um, and, and again, that might be beneficial to you if you want to. Also checking um, family tax benefits that you wouldn't normally be, you know, the family tax benefit A and B will be dependent on the family situation. Now you might not have previously been able to get that, but dependent, you might actually now qualify for some of those payments. So um, again, it's, it's worth when you're, go when you're going through the process, which is, which is on the MyGov website, is really capturing everything. Yeah. And I believe there's the, the there's the, also the special coronavirus sort of once off payment, or I think there's two lots of seven hundred and fifty dollars as well. Mm. I think the first lot of that started to go out to people, hasn't it? Yeah, so it probably started about a week ago, and I think the last of the payments are expected in about a week and a half, and then the secondary payments are in July. And that's a pretty wide net, I understand, that it includes pretty much anyone who gets any sort of special assistance or any special payments from, from Services Australia or, or the government yeah. generally. So my understanding of that is that if you are already receiving some form of payment, so you're receiving even if, even if it's just a family tax benefit, um, obviously all pensioners, disability support workers, anyone on the job seeker payment already, you must have been receiving that between the 12th of March to the to the 13th of April or something. Okay. You know, so anyone who was already on it or had registered prior to that time, you'll get that one off payment. Um, if, however, it's after the date, then you would potentially be eligible for the July one. And that's that, just that $750 one off payment. Okay. Now, I know you do amazing events, Cara, where you help individuals with their own sort of cash flow budgeting and personal budgeting, um, sort of looking at their personal affairs, even outside of you know, situations like COVID that we're in now. What other advice would you give to someone who loses their job? And I suppose I'm coming at this from a perspective of how else can employers guide or, or in, not instruct, but you know, guide their employees to look after themselves if they were to lose their job? Yeah, um, it's certainly an interesting time in that we almost need to go back to the basics of money management, which is, yeah. you know, like not, um, I think people sometimes forget some of these, these aspects. And so obviously reviewing the expenses that we have on our normal day-to-day -day life. So that, that might be um, contacting home insurance, car insurance, providers seeing you know if there's better deals seeing what you can do to change those um you know most people have to have quit their gym memberships and all of that sort of stuff because these things uh, are affected so obviously reviewing big expenses seeing if you can cut some costs there is is a big one um, the home loan repayments one is coming up a lot so um, and i'm not sure if you guys have spoken about this on, on one of the previous 
um, whether only at a high level. Sure. So, um, you know, a lot of people have home loans or they have tenants in properties. And, um, and so the banks are being a little bit more lenient, but there's probably two concerns with this. One is the, the home loan um, holiday that is, that is available. And a lot of people don't understand that what ends up happening is that figure goes on to the top of your home loan. So it's basically increasing your debt level. Um, so and that's, most- if that's when they don't pay anything and they just let the interest accrue and don't make yeah. any repayments whatsoever. Exactly. And you know what, for some people, I understand that if it gets to that, that's, that's what people have to do. In, this, in these situations, people are going to do what they need to do. However, some people don't understand that's what's happening. So at the end of that three, six month period, however, however long you've got that home loan um, vacation for, um, your home loan will be higher. Um, and the other negative is with that is now there is a potential record for you saying that you applied for financial hardship, which could affect your credit rating in the future. Now, I understand that banks are saying that they're going to be lenient on this and not make it an issue. Um, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, and so having that on your record is probably, um, it, you know, again, it's one of those things I say it's, it's kind of the last resort. If anything, you could potentially look at changing yourself to an interest only payment for three to six months if that is required. So that's kind of like um, just understanding what's available to you with your bank before you go down that vacation route. Um, and then there's other little tips like, you know, really be mindful of doing online shopping right now. I think people are at home and, and they're getting involved in that a little bit. So I'm trying to trying to curb that. Um, and then different benefits, like, you know, looking at your credit card and your flybys and stuff. I'm telling people if they've been racking up points for travel, we're obviously not going anywhere for a few months. So it might be worth converting those to say Coles or Woolies vouchers so that you can use them for groceries and just your everyday expenses, especially as the finances get a little bit tough. So they're, they're the kind of things that we're telling people to do on a really micro level to help their everyday cash flow management. But when things are tight, we need to get micro, don't we? Sure do. Yeah. I know I said to my wife the other day, if you've got any gift cards or you've got any credits left for some, some dress stores, maybe you should go use that because we don't know if those stores will still be around in a, in a couple of months' time. Well, un- unfortunately, that's true. As much as that's a terrible thing to say, it could be the case, yeah. Yeah. What about you, Rebecca? Are you, you sort of giving any advice in that regard to, to people thinking about their own sort of budgeting or, or, or what to do when things are getting tight? Again, from a perspective of what should an employer be guiding their employees with? Absolutely. Um, sometimes we, we try to be really delicate around the instructing people to pull back their personal finances. Sometimes they can be a little bit insulted. Uh, but the reality is that when you're working, there's good money coming in or, or money coming in, you live a particular lifestyle. That lifestyle is a little bit over right now, particularly when your funds go. And um, it can be this process as simple as just comparing your rates for your current providers with somebody else. And it doesn't hurt to make a phone call and ask for a better deal. You, it's amazing what people will be willing to give to you if you just ask. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah. Rebecca, I see we've got a few questions there on the Q&A. Yeah, so we've got a couple of questions. Just dialing back to um, what we were talking about with the job seeker um, payments. Um, we've got here Mark has asked whether or not um, employers needed to give their employees a letter saying that the hours were being reduced so that they were eligible for job seeker. Um, do you know anything about that, Cara? Um, I have seen that they're not requesting it um, at this stage. But from my perspective, if you're in if you're an employer, um, it would be helpful because it sort of means that they can tick the boxes quickly if it ever does come into question. Um, but my understanding is they're not requesting that where they would normally would. Okay, great. Um, but they might, is there a possibility if they're not requesting it now, they might come back and request it when they decide to catch up on all their paperwork? Yeah, there's a total possibility. And that's why if, you know, especially we're, we're, we're obviously talking about very legitimate situations here, you know, there's there's no real harm in in writing a letter to say that someone's been stood down or they have to go leave without pay or whatever the whatever the situation is yeah 
Absolutely. I, and just to um, clarify again quickly for the people who are listening, there's been, um, for those who have to go onto Job Seeker, there's been the change to the income test, which is great, but also the asset test has been completely waived. So that's no longer something that people need to address when they're applying for Job Seeker. For now. Okay. For now. So, and yes. I, I might just add to that too is that there used to be a um, liquid asset waiting period on all Job Seeker, seeker applications, which I think, depending on how much funds you had, was like 13 weeks. If you were partway through that waiting period and already applying from maybe say a month ago, it's no longer applied to you. So if, if you are in that situation or, or someone you know is in that situation, it's worth touching base with Centrelink again and going, hey, hang on a second. I've been told I don't need to wait anymore. In theory, the payments should begin immediately. Um, and so it's worth, again, they've got so much influx of, of work coming through. It's worth just um, backing yourself on that and making a phone call. In a really practical sense around that, because um, you're working maybe a little bit closer with some people than we are with um, Centrelink, what, if, what are you telling them? Is the phone the best way to go about it, to get online, to physically go down there um, as much as we're not supposed to go out? Yeah. Is, there, is there something that you're telling them to do about actually getting their answers quicker? Yeah, so um, MyGov is the first place to go, definitely. The, the thing is, if you can make it as easy for them as possible, as with all business, we know this, right? Um, then you are going to get a quicker outcome. So if you've got a MyGov login, follow through that system. And then you might need to make a call once it's, once it's progressed. But that's the first port of call. If you make a phone call, they're just going to send you directly there. So it's just a waste of time. If you obviously stand in queue, again, they're going to try and get you set up with this MyGov system if you don't already have it. So that's the first port of call. Um, probably the biggest issue with this is, yes, they're wait, waiving waiting periods but their processing times are slow. Um, yeah. Just the influx is crazy. So for me, one of the biggest things I'm saying is get online quickly because that's the quickest way to do it. But also you're probably going to have to slowly push this through with a few phone calls and expect that it's going to take a little longer than it normally would. Yeah, okay. That's understandable, but very frustrating. Um, one of the uh, one of the comments that you made around getting some assistance from your banks was in regards to um, the compounding interest and potentially then actually people defaulting if they don't actually contact their banks in advance. At this stage and over the next six months, could you see any defaults on loans um, impacting people's credit rating badly or would it be potentially um, a situation where they'll be able to get that waived and removed from their credit rating quite quickly? I understand that this is all new and you don't have all yeah. the answers, but more of an opinion, I suppose. Yeah. My opinion with this, regardless of time, to be honest with you, is that if you as the consumer are proactive and on the front foot with any provider with, in context with this, they would prefer to work with you to, to get a better outcome for yeah. both of you. And so um, maybe, maybe it won't have as much and maybe they'll be more lenient. They're certainly suggesting that that's the case. But um, I'm always the person that, if you get on the front foot and suggest either some form of payment plan, even if it's lower than the minimum, they are so much more appreciative and accepting because it's one less thing they need to worry about. So for me, it's always be proactive when it comes to that, um, if you possibly can. And it's good to have on your record as well, isn't it? So that when you get to the end of this and let's say your debt's accumulated to a higher amount and then they start applying their usual sort of metrics again, um, mm -hmm. it's going to be good to have your record that you've been upfront and, and open Correct. to talk with them. And they'll, they'll and chase I, you last after the other people who have just been <laughs> ignoring them, basically, yeah. I like that. Aim to be and the I one to that ch chase the, last. Correct. That's the same approach that we're taking with our clients um, in regards to the ATO as well, yeah. isn't it, John? Yeah, absolutely. Always be on the front. I mean, some of the deferrals for ATO, you don't get unless you actually talk to them. You might get GIC remitted and so forth, but still, you've got to be up front. You've got to talk to them in advance. Yeah. Any so more questions, there, Rebecca? No, but I do just want to say, uh, while we are talking about contacting people, so if you are seeing things out there and even what we've put out with the ATO are being quite generous at the moment and are deferring payments, exactly what John said, it's not automatic. Don't just not pay. 
you have to yeah. contact them and let them know that that's what's happening. Absolutely. Um, I want to ask one more question for you, Cara, um, around that personal budgeting. Um, mm. So someone's in a bit of, you know, bit of strife. How do you recommend them, them do their budgets? I always remember my mum had money jars above the oven. And I remember when we first got married, we had envelopes, you know, in our family, we took, <laughs> we use offset accounts, but what, what do you recommend? Yeah. Uh, look, I'm a, in, in general, normal life, I'm a segregator of money. And yeah. so for me, it's the, the main bills, you know, everyday life, the mandatory expenses that come up. So especially in this regard, um, if you're in a bit of an emergency situation, it's worth writing down exactly the, the minimum of everything that you need just to get by. Um, and then I segregate out all discretionary expenses. So, um, you know, as much as I hate to say it, things like coffees. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> some of us can still afford a, a couple of life luxuries. Um, but, you know, um, uh, clothing, um, entertainment spending, um, anything a- that is considered discretionary it should be segregated out because one, it's easy for us to see where we can cut the money. Um, and like you said, offset accounts are the best place because you get to reduce the interest you're paying on your home loan as well. So I'm a very big fan of offset accounts in that regard. Um, but for me, like with the people who are, are really struggling financially, I've just basically said, understand your absolute minimum requirements um, and make sure that you can meet those before you're spending anything anywhere else on discretionary. And unfortunately, because the payments that are announced are actually pretty good and pretty generous, but they're way below the levels that people would be earning. It's, you're going to yeah. feel this. And so continuing to live that lifestyle with those discretionary expenses is going to hurt some people. And that's one of the struggles, isn't it? Usually you're set up for a lifestyle with home loans and so forth, car loans at a certain level. You cut the income and you now got less coming in. You can't automatically just get rid of the home loans, get rid of the car loans and, and all those things you've, you've chosen for a certain income level. Okay. Cara, I had a question submitted um, to me earlier. Can employers hire back on a casual basis someone they have previously terminated? And specifically, how does this affect job seeker payment? Yeah, okay. Um, if you know. Yeah, this might overflow a little bit into what we know about the job keeper yep. side of things. And it also depends on when they were terminated and when you are hiring them back. So if my, my understanding is that if you do hire them back, um, if they had been previously employed by you, say, prior to one March and they were laid off during this period and then you hire them back, you can potentially put them through the job keeper scenario, which um, is likely a better situation for everybody involved because one, the employer gets to keep that employee ready to rock and roll when they do start, when they can hit the ground and run. Um, but two, the actual payment, if it does come through, what we know about it will actually work out to be higher yeah. than the job seeker. However, if they're currently on job seeker in the interim, I believe they can still continue getting job seeker because their actual income, assuming that there is none, they're just going to put them on casual so they can get them onto the job keeper. Um, it should still stand until it reverts. That's my yeah. understanding. It'll be interesting how they administer that, isn't it? You know, yeah, like you said, all the statements around job keeper is, oh, it's okay if you've laid someone off already, we'll just now put them on job keeper. But in my head, I'm just thinking about all the practicalities of going to Centrelink and now telling them not to pay me um, with something because I'm going to get this payment over here. And, and the job keeper payment doesn't start flowing until May. Mm. Um, so you might want to be on job seeker until then um, yeah. anyway, if your employer can't afford to, to pay you in the interim. Okay. So let's, um, let's pivot the conversation over to this job keeper um, discussion now, because it has been the number one topic of discussion um, this week, obviously since the announcements, I might just share my screen here um, from everybody and um, just bring up our blog. Um, where we summarise some of the detail here um, so that we can just refer to some of the detail and, um, and, and explain it for you. Now, um, one of the first requirements is that you need to be an eligible employer. 
So one of the key things about this initiative, and, and ScoMo talked about it, is that they're trying to provide the support through mechanisms and processes that or systems that already exist. So they really are asking the employers to effectively be the administrator of this system um, on behalf of the on behalf of the individuals, really, and, and on behalf of the government. So the payment will be made to the employers, and they have responsibility to make sure an amount is then paid to the employees. So to be an eligible employee, I assume everyone on this call has turnover less than one billion dollars, um, but you need to be able to show a drop in income of thirty percent, and I'll come back to that. You needed to have eligible employees as at the 1st of March, um, and you need to confirm that each eligible employee is still engaged by the business. Now, that, that fourth point there sort of raises a few questions, and a lot of people have been asking me, well, can I cut their wage, reduce their hours and so forth, uh, maybe turn them into casual or turn them into part-time? And I don't believe we've got a categoric answer on that, but my understanding is that is the intention that you are able to reduce hours and so forth um, with these with these individuals and they'll still be considered an eligible employee. Rebecca, have you seen anything further on that? Um, again, like you said, there's nothing in legislation. So at the moment, most of this is just conjecture and um, yeah. peer, peer conversation in the accounting community. But... Um, at, at this stage, I, I understand that that's exactly the way it is. There's not been any further clarification yet. You haven't seen anything else on that, Cara, to add to that? No. No. Um, so then when we um, get to this 30% test, now the 30% test is a big part of it, isn't it? We've got to be able to show that we've had a drop in income of 30%. So the government updated some of their fact sheets um, and websites yesterday to talk a bit more about the 30% and how they will measure the 30% drop in income. And I've essentially summarized it on here into four different ways that you can prove the 30% test. And they're suggesting in there that it'll be a comparison to the previous year. So let's say that your March in 2020 is 30% down on March 2019. Likewise, they've set a comparison of the March quarter versus the same quarter in the previous year. They've also said that the commissioner, the tax commissioner that is, will have discretion to consider additional information and the commissioner may also come up with their own tests to administer this. And that's pretty important. Those last two are actually really important because if you've got a new business, you're not going to have a comparison to last year. Or if you've got a business that's been growing at a rapid rate over the last year, then last year's not even representative. Or maybe you've bought a business during the time and therefore what you're comparing this year to last year is not representative. But at least we've got some more guidance as to what the government is thinking about this. And so our starting point for applying this is looking at the previous year, although we still don't know exactly how that will come out um, in the legislation. Um, the only other thing I would say is think about what the government's trying to achieve with this legislation. And they're trying to actually pay money to people to keep them in a job. So if someone's doors are shut on a certain day, then you're not going to have to wait a month to prove that your income's dropped by a month. And I think that's part of the commissioner's discretion here that you should be able to just put your hand up and say, um, my business has closed its doors. I want to keep these guys employed. Um, and, and therefore apply for the job keeper allowance. The big thing to, is register your interest um, on the tax office website. Um, if you just Google job keeper, um, it'll come up. Otherwise we've got the link um, within our blog here as well. Um, the other requirement is they need to be eligible employees, which are basically they're currently employed, stood down or rehired by the eligible employee. Again, that stood down terminology we talked about in our last um, convo, which you can get from our blog. They needed to have been employed on the 1st of March, full-time, part-time, or what they're calling long-term casuals. And a long-term casual is taken to be someone who's been employed for more than 12 months on a casual basis up to the 1st of March. Um, they have to be an Australian citizen and there are some visa, I think some New Zealand visas are eligible for this um, as well. And you can obviously only get one job keeper payment um, per person. They can't get it from multiple um, employees. So um, as, with regards to the, to the process, we know that employers are required to register um, and they'll effectively be, be um, required to administer this. So the number one tip is to jump on there and register your infest. That'll keep you up to date with different things. The payment will be made to the employer and the employer needs to pay at least the $1,500 to the employee as well. 
Rebecca, have you got anything to add to that? Um, no, I don't, but I think we might just really quickly jump to um, some of the questions um, sure. before you move on there. Um, the job seeker payment, uh, job keeper payments at this point look like they're going to be a little bit of a solution for some of those um, people who run businesses as sole traders or just receive trust distributions or dividends. Again, this is our understanding of the way that it's going to be able to be applied and that uh, once you register your business, you'll be able to nominate at this stage, it looks like only one individual who was someone who was effectively on wages, but not, or receiving a payment for their services and their effort, but not actually declaring items as wages on their buses um, or through the payroll system. Yeah. You will I, then I, be able to be eligible for one, one person, $1,500 a fortnight as well. And again, we emphasize we don't have legislation for this. Um, right. I will just show you on the screen here. There is a, um, a section of, of the website of business.gov.au, which says that the intention is that if you receive income by way of dividend or distribution, that one person can elect to get the job keeper payment. Um, I've got to update this, the formatting of this blog, but um, um, it, that's what the intention is per business.gov.au. Now that is not in the fact sheets um, that are on the treasury website. And we don't just do not know whether it's in the, um, whether it's in the draft legislation at the moment. There was one concerning comment in one of the fact sheets on the treasury website, which talked about a self-employed individual. Now that in accountant land would mean it'd be a sole trader who's just trading in a personal ABN. Um, so my concern is that it's limited to individual sole traders, but unfortunately we just don't know any more yet to provide any more, any more clarity on that one. Is there any more questions in there on that one, Rebecca? Um, let me just check. I think I've got a couple of people who are typing away right now. So um, in regards to the JobKeeper payments um, for apprentices, will the previous government announcement that 50% of the apprentice wages will be given back? Now, again, because it's not legislation, the JobKeeper payments, our understanding or my understanding at least is that um, all the previous announcements, stimulus packages and, and benefits that are being applied will still be in place and the 1500 will be on top of that. Is that your understanding as well, John? Yeah, no, that's my understanding. I haven't seen anything to say those other 50% wage subsidies will not be effective. Remembering though, they were only for trainees and um, apprentices anyway. So they probably had limited, um, limited scope there. That's right. Yeah, and that the same sort of scenario will potentially apply to um, anyone who's also eligible for the PAYG offset payments as well. So that we're hoping to get some more clarity once this becomes legislation, exactly how we balance all of these payments that are going out to everybody. Yeah. Carrie, you're probably getting employers calling you or, or business owners calling you like, like we are and saying, well, what should I do here? Should I be laying them off and, and encouraging them to get job seeker? Or now should I be thinking about job keeper? What advice are you, or what direction are you leading them at the moment? Well, uh, there's a couple of ways. One is job keeper is going to, in theory, be the more superior payment. Yeah. But it's not available yet so yes exactly there have been a lot of people um, and a lot of businesses that have put their employees on leave without pay for an indefinite period of time which in theory allows them to get the job seeker until a point where we think they could potentially get job keeper now again yeah. we're basing it on assumptions of, of all of this sort of stuff but for especially for the smaller businesses they've been looking at doing that more so uh, because depending on the industry and, and as you know um, they, they should come out of this eventually okay yeah. it's how it's how long they can the the um, the employees can sort of sit around not getting another job um, yeah. and again depends on the industry what's available but there are like there are still people job seeking out there so yeah because I mean even if an employer um, intends to put someone on job keeper 
They don't actually know whether they're eligible to put them on JobKeeper yet. Exactly. Um, yes, they've said they will back pay it to, um, I can't remember whether it was back to the, the 30th, the 30th of of March or March something. March yeah. or something. I think it was some even went back to the 1st of March or something or rather. I don't know. Mm. But anyway, by the time the first payment is made to the employer in the first week of May, there's a whole nother month of wages in there already, which if you don't know whether you're getting JobKeeper or not, and I'm an employer who doesn't have a lot of money available to me, um, I can see you being a little bit in limbo as to whether you actually fork out that money. Um, I know I've had a lot of people saying, well, I've got to get their wages down to the 1500 at least, and then I'll pay them the 1500 and, and you know, have them stood down effectively. Go from there. Yeah, I mean, it's a real case-by-case -case situation. I guess this is where I see a potential issue though, um, let's say someone is on leave without pay, they put their employer's leave without pay and that employee applies for job seeker, um, yep. which is taxable, right? So yep. it, it's a taxable income. Um, and then they do end up qualifying for the job keeper, which is paid as of May and potentially backdated because I dare yep. say this administration thing is not gonna necessarily go smoothly. There yeah. could be a double up of payment, again, both taxable and both payable back to Centrelink yeah. once it all comes out in the wash. And so I'm a bit mindful and a bit concerned about how in practicality that might overlap and then cause a payment back to Centrelink when it is found out that there is almost a double payment, which is not necessarily intentional by people, but there is a concern that it could happen. And one, that people aren't electing to pay the tax, but two, that they could end up having to pay the extra payment back. And well, they might have to pay something to the tax office when they lodge their tax return as well, because they, they, they may not have deducted enough tax from the, um, from the exactly. payments. Exactly, exactly. And so that's, you know, from a practicality standpoint, because the timing's different, I'm not 100% sure how that's going to work out. But I suppose in the short term, it's probably best to at least apply for the job seeker um, because uh, you don't know what the business is. And, and, and employees don't know what the business's financials are going to do if they're going to qualify for that 30% reduction. Yeah. And if they don't, how long that process is to prove that, for example, that business has been in growth phase. And so therefore, it's a yeah. completely different set of, yeah, so there's there's so much unknown. I, I did see on the fact sheet from the Treasury website yesterday, they did express that there will be a tolerance, a certain amount of tolerance given that if someone expects their income is going to drop by 30% and it drops by, I don't know, 28% instead of 30%, that they're not going to go chase um, a heap of yeah. repayments in that regard. But this is a whole new system, even though it's being administered through the wages system, um, that there's just going to be a whole range of things that come up. And we do expect that there will be some anti-avoidance measures in here, just like there were in the cash boost payments um, incentive as well. And that if you do something to specifically increase your opportunity to get it, um, then quite possibly you won't get anything. Um, I know there's a, lot, a couple of questions on there from some real estate um, agencies, Rebecca. So I just wanted to quickly address that. Firstly, we're going to do a real estate specific conversation um, in the next little while, uh, maybe even this afternoon. So we might have that out tomorrow. Um, that'll probably just be a recorded one to discuss some of the issues there. Unfortunately, we don't have all the answers um, for the real estate agencies. One of the specific questions that comes up is around your debit credit salespeople. Um, my gut reaction is that I don't think you can apply the $1,500 within a debit credit arrangement and that it would need to be a payment made to the employee and not added back for any commission calculations down the track. Um, if you've got a commission only agent um, and they're not selling anything, maybe you, you, you're going to have to pay them this $1,500 as a minimum. And I expect that the best way to treat that is going to be, they're going to get their 1500 no matter what, because that's come from the government and then their commission comes on top. I can't see you being able to deduct this 1500 off the commission like you would normally do um, in a situation. One of the other questions which came in um, earlier, um, yep, I've answered the bit about com only sales agents. Um, if the intention is to handle it, oh, agents get the 1500 per fortnight. I want to clarify something about the superannuation, okay? So um, the, the Prime Minister even said it himself the other day that there's no superannuation on this 1500 payment. I think, I think that's quietly, um, slightly a little bit misleading. My understanding in more detail later on is that if they're a casual and they already get $1,000 a fortnight, you still have to pay them $1,000 a fortnight and the superannuation on that. 
if they then get boosted up to the 1500 by getting this payment, it's discretionary as to whether you have to pay superannuation on the extra $500. I don't believe it is actually correct that there's no superannuation on the 1500 at all, unless they previously never got anything, I suppose, which I can't understand how that, how that would work. One of the big things also for real estate agents on the, on the webinar is we've got this interesting conundrum of how we prove we've had a 30% drop in income because most real estate agents who have a sales focus are still receiving income to this day for settlements on contracts that had previously been signed. So your income might actually be fine in April. So you probably won't be able to rely on the comparison to last year, uh, or you may not be able to rely on the comparison to, to last year. So it might have to be one of those ones that falls into one of the other tests that the, that the commissioner puts out there, or one of the ones where the commissioner has some discretion um, to, um, to, to do that. Rebecca, we got any other questions on there that you'd like us to answer? We've got a couple of uh, people who are asking about um, the fifteen hundred and people who don't normally earn fifteen hundred dollars a fortnight. So to make it really clear, the fifteen hundred is going if you're eligible, and those employees are eligible, it's going to be a flat payment to you, and that payment needs to be made to the employees, even if they don't normally earn that much. It needs to go to them. You can't keep any of that in the business. Exactly. And you still have to wear the administration and other costs of holding that employee um, within the books as well. That's right. Good. Anything else on there, Rebecca? Um, I think we've almost covered everything here. Uh, we've just got another question again around being a director of a new company who hasn't paid themselves a wage, just the employees. Now that's going to be um, an interesting one because even if the directors of a company um, are eligible for one payment. I haven't seen anything that says, um, that talks about if that company also has employees and normally the directors only receive their payment via dividends. At this stage, I don't feel that the directors themselves are going to be eligible for wait, uh, for the 1500 at all at yeah, this stage. It's that whole one in that whole, we just don't know yet from a self-employed perspective. Um, self-employed individuals that employ people, I think that might be clear that you can choose um, one person to get the 1500, one owner to get the $1,500. But if it's through a company or a trust, I think we still just don't have clarity on that, unfortunately. That's right. And hopefully that'll come. There are a couple of other questions there that are very similar to some of the things we've already answered. Um, most of the answers will come a lot clearer, hopefully in the next few days after the, um, the job keeper actually becomes legislation and we've got some better workable examples and something to fall back on. Um, right now, I, I feel that we've probably covered what we know. Um, is there yeah, any well, other questions? There's a question on there from Gail as well around com only sales agents being an eligible employee. As long as they're paid as employees, we understand they'll be eligible employees. Um, if they're independent contractors though, then there'll be nothing, there's nothing in this job keeper package for independent contractors. They would have to look at the independent contractor self-employed rules once we finally get some clarity on that. Tracy's got a question about the job keeper payments to apprentices Will the previous government announcement of the 50% apprentices be given back? Okay, yeah, we did answer that one already. There was probably one something to highlight that we didn't, I don't think we explicitly yep. said, was there's probably um, an onus on the employers to make sure they tax that 1500 for their employees. Yes. Um, and uh, it seems obvious, but it's probably one of those things just to highlight because I think people will expect to get 1500 in the hand, but the chances of that is obviously lower and that it's probably on the employer to tax them. Yeah, no, I think that's that's a good point to emphasise, Caro, because I think a lot of people are just expecting this $1,500 to appear in their bank account, um, but you've actually got some tax we're going to need to take out of that. And if they've already had, I don't know, um, 60 grand's worth of income for the year, then the tax rates haven't changed yet. So we're still going to have to take um, a decent amount of tax out of that $1,500, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, there was a question in there in the, in the chat as well from Ross. If an employer loses a key person in their role that would have been covered by JobKeeper, then has to replace them, they will lose the job keeper payment. I believe so. I believe it's based on the person, not the position. So it has to be an eligible employee that was employed on the 1st of March. Um, Cara and, and Rebecca, you agree with that view of that? 
I do agree with that view. And, um, and particularly now that single touch payroll exists and I think most businesses are complying with those STP rules, it's going to be really easy to see who that individual is who is eligible for the payment. Yeah. Uh, Mark's also got a question around the um, the cash boost or the 100% PAYG um, offset or credits, probably a better way to describe it. Yes, we understand it will work in tandem um, with the um, with the wage subsidy um, or the JobKeeper um, allowance in there as well. Um, guys, if there's any more questions, post those up there for us now. Um, I think we've probably answered most of those, have we, Rebecca? Yeah, I think we have. Um, there is one other question here around whether or not the assessment of the change in profits will be based on cash or accrual. Uh, we don't know, except what I would say is that generally with everything like this, it's on a consistent approach. So if we're, you're comparing this March to last March and last March you reported on a cash basis, then it would be cash basis again this year. If it's on a accrual basis you're reporting, um, then that's what you would use again. So the, the ATO is just going to be around looking for consistency in reporting. Yeah, that sort of came out with the cash boost discussion as well, wasn't it, with their anti-avoidance okay. provisions. They just wanted to see consistency. I mean, another yeah. way to think about that is what system are they using to track this? And they're using single touch payroll and they're using your activity statements. So on your activity statements, you show your income as a business every month or every quarter that you do your, your activity statement. So that's what they will be looking at and that's what they'll be referring to within their data to assess whether your income is actually up or actually down um, compared to the, to the previous year before you get to those backup discretions and so forth, which we expect in the legislation and we don't know for certain yet. There was a suggestion in the Treasury fact sheets around self-assessment of the 30%. I think that's just, again, their intention to to um, have a to have a reasonable approach to whether you've um, whether you've lost thirty percent of income or not. Yeah, guys, we'll keep you up to date with any new announcements that come out on this via our COVID update uh, update blog. So if you go on the website, we'll try and keep it at the top of the blog all the time. We're continually going in and updating that with every anything new that comes out. Um, so bookmark that and keep going back to it. Um, a copy of this webinar video will be saved in the blog as well. So instead of going to events, go to blog. And by all means, if you haven't already, subscribe to our newsletter so you get all the invites to these webinars, so you get all the invites um, for any updated um, blogs and everything that go out as well. Cara and Rebecca, I just want to ask you one last question before we wrap up, and it's a pretty simple one, um, and that is what is your number one piece of advice um, that you would give employers and employees um, through this situation, given our topic here today? Um, and I might start with you, Cara, if that's all right. Yeah, it's um, plan for the worst and expect the best. So um, when it comes to anything with personal finances and stuff, I'm uh, be cautious and you know hopefully we come out of it and if you have a little bit of extra money because you saved more than you than you thought then great good time to invest yeah. otherwise um you know be really mindful be really yeah. mindful of spending yeah yeah good one rebecca uh if you're unsure reach out to your accountant or advisor um where as soon as we have the information we will help you through things don't wade through and lodge any applications on your own if you really if you really don't know the answer reach out but also be a little bit patient because there's a lot of be reaching out right now yeah <laughs> but we will yeah uh, as, as an industry we are um we're staying abreast of what's going on and getting back to everybody as, as soon as humanly possible. And if we don't have the precise answer, we'll do our best to guide you and to give you some direction on what you may be able to do. Um, I suppose my tip would be um, there is so much unknown out there at the moment. There is so much uncertainty out there. Um, and sometimes that unknown, sometimes that uncertainty can actually distract us from making a decision. Um, and so we can only actually make decisions based on what we do know. And so I encourage you, don't get lost in what you don't know um, at the moment. Guys, thank you so much for joining us on our Calm COVID Convo again today. Uh, we'll be having more co convos over the next week. Um, we're going to be trying and roll out more and more um, over the next little while. The next one we're going to have is on cost cutting. 
um, within your business? Um, what are some tips? What are some ideas? What are some things? What are some processes? What are some practical tips that you can take away to go and have a look at your costs within the business? I hate the idea of cutting team or reducing wages for team, but unfortunately, we don't know how long this is going to last. So maybe we do have to, um, to make some decisions sooner rather than later because two months down the track, it will have cost the business a whole lot more. Keep an eye out for our updates on our blog. Keep an eye out for the invite to our next webinar. Um, if you have any questions that we haven't been able to answer today, please don't hesitate to reach out um, to us um, one place at businessdepot.com.au. We'll do our absolute best to guide you or give you an answer on that. And otherwise, until next time. Thank you, Cara. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks for everyone Thanks, joining. Thanks, John. Peace, guys. Bye-bye.